Well, welcome everybody. We got another awesome episode this week. Uh, but real quick, let me introduce my co-host, Clem Harrod. What up, Clem? Yeah, man. Production channel. <laughs> <laughs> what was how you doing, man? Man, you know I'm doing wonderful. Just finished the gig on the road. Now I'm uh, back home, daddy daycaring it, having a great time with oh the kids gosh. and the family. About to do some laundry today. It's Wash Wednesday. It's laundry day. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Maybe, let me guess, is it all blacks? You basically just run one load. Man, you know I don't blacks. wear show black. I can't wear show black, man. It's just not, it's just not in my nature. I can't do it. <laughs> that is true. I can say that Clem is the classiest backstage uh, dresser that I possibly know. For sure. <laughs> oh, oh, Chris Jeffries. Well, Chris, Chris Jeffries is pretty good, too. That's true. Yep. That's true. Well, cool, man. Well, hey, dude, I'm really uh, super stoked about today. Today, we get to move into a new world uh, that we really haven't talked about yet here on the production channel, yes. and that is uh, really moving into the world of sports and broadcast and really even touching a little bit more into the news side. So, uh, Clem, who do we got on uh, with us today? Oh, man, we have my friend, my former director, <laughs> Mr. Greg Harting. He is, he is the director of for the Orlando Magic broadcast for Fox Sports Florida. And man, he's been he's been the director there. He was with the Denver Nuggets before that. 35 plus years of oh, experience. Man. That I'm man, this is my buddy. Like I am so looking forward to having this conversation with him. Welcome, Greg. Hey guys. <laughs> Thanks for joining, man. Hey, yes. Clem, I've got I've been on the road for twelve days. Do you have some laundry you can do for me? I mean, can you do my laundry? Can I do your laundry? <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> right. I don't think I have hey. anything that's black in there either. So Right, right. Yep. Yep. No, but I know you got a lot of buttons. That's true. Downs. He wor- <laughs> he works in a broadcast truck, so he doesn't have to do the show black. Stuff. Nope. Right, right. No. He is Greg is is buttoned down all the time. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So, Greg, just tell us how you got your start in this industry. Give us the beginning of your journey. Um, well, guys, uh, I went to uh, Western Kentucky University in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Go Hilltoppers. Hilltoppers. And, and started in local news after that at the uh, one local TV station in town. Uh, opened my eyes. um you know, and learned so much in the uh, in the two and a half years that I worked in local TV, and bounced around. It feels like a hundred places, but finally, after close to twenty years of doing local TV, I had the opportunity to start moving into sports TV, and uh, and then uh, in about two thousand, became a full time freelancer, both doing uh, technical directing work and some directing work. And a few years after that, got my uh, got my opportunity to start directing NBA games for uh, Man. for the Denver Nuggets. And then two years later, moved on to the Orlando Magic. And I've been doing games for the Magic and Fox Sports for the last nine years. Wow, that's awesome! What was your What was your first role at that TV station, that local TV station? Oh, it, you really want to know everything? <laughs> I, I do. I'm curious. Everything. <laughs> When you're in yeah. the when you're in the 212th market and there's oh. one station in town, you literally did everything. I'm uh, sure. Swept the floors and called the cameras. Uh, you, you, you know what? I, I I love telling this story. Um, <laughs> we used to, you know, within you know, you're at a local TV, teeny tiny market. You're doing everything. I was directing the local uh, the morning newscast, which I think you know back in those days we maybe had a 15, 30 minute newscast. And part of my responsibilities was, let's see here, I was the director, technical director, audio guy, graphics person, <laughs> and during commercial breaks, this is at the very start of when uh, when you started getting teleprompters in the studio. Uh, and I would mm-hmm. have to run to the studio during commercial breaks and change out the long strip of paper teleprompter for the anchor because he, he would run his own prompter with the controller. But part of my duty was to still go change out his paper for him in the commercial breaks. 
Oh my god. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You know what? You know what that tells me how young I am? And I'm not even that young anymore, but still compared to you, old man. Uh <laughs> oh, I never man. even knew. <laughs> I never even knew that they used to have paper based teleprompters. Oh yeah, the, legitimately. Yeah, the scripts were uh you had to rip you had to physically rip the scripts. It was four or five copies with Back in those days, it was with carbon in between, so you had to sort of rip the carbon out, and everybody got, oh, you know, man. the anchors got the white copy or the pink, the pink copy was graphics or something, something, and the, you know, weren't those flammable? Copy, yes, and the top copy with the best ink was what you put on the uh, prompter, you know, with its little camera on there, and I, you'd go down before the before the show started and sort of lay out the segments and tape them all together and hang them on the wall. And then uh, during the breaks, I'd have to run down and move the, uh, we had a tape dispenser that you'd sit on the conveyor belt and you'd take that off and replace the script and put it back down because otherwise if you didn't put the tape dispenser on, it would be too heavy on the far end that was already on the ground and all of a sudden you'd see the paper go flying off onto the ground. <laughs> so then the anchor, oh then the goodness. anchor really had nothing to read. So. Ad lib. I'm adding. I'm adding that. I'm adding that to the list of things that I never have experienced. <laughs> right up there next to traditional slide projectors. I, by the time oh, I, I came into the too. industry, they already had PowerPoint. <laughs> I, did, I did that too. We oh, you were a projectionist. Use, uh, well, n- yeah, if you can call it that. Uh, you know, we'd have to. Back in those days, you had you had slides that you used on the um, on the over the shoulder graphics. These stories. And we used to use the coffee stirs. You would put them in the in the film chain to line up the slides so they weren't all crooked and stuff. Because you never knew how they were going to load in there. So you'd use the coffee stirs to sort of to level <laughs> things out. But that's what you did. You did what you did what you had to do to make it look good. I don't know that's right. So how did you make it from news to sports? You said you or live, um, you know, local television to sports. Yeah. Um, well, I moved to uh, after bouncing around a few few local markets and moving my way up. Uh, when I um, I was working in Tampa, and two friends of mine were living out in Denver at the time, and uh, they're like, you know, you should move out to Denver. You'd love it out here. There's a you know, a, and part of the deal was there was a vibrant sports production community out there, and uh, and. So I kept my job working at the local TV station. I stayed there for another two or three years after I got there. But gradually, more and more, I started doing the local te- the local sporting events out there, and you know, quickly realized that that was my that that was going to be my you know my first real big change in my career path. Going even though I was staying in TV, just going mm-hmm. from local news to sports. So after you know. After a couple, like I said, a couple three years, all of a sudden it was like, well, you know, I'm working all the time doing sports, and I and I'm really kind of burnt out on the whole news thing. Yeah. So it was just it was a it was an easy decision to make once enough you know once the opportunity presented itself for enough work. So right, and that was right. that was right about uh, that was right about two thousand. So. <laughs> well, what what was your first role on the sports side? Because when I started, I started off as a utility, <coughs> and then I did some, you know, in house jumbotron shooting, and then a uh, scoreboard operator before I became a camera operator. What was your? Transition? I didn't know you were a scoreboard operator, Clem. Holy cow! Oh, for the camera, I, yeah, I shot, I shot the in house a little bit. Huh. You got to work yeah. your way up. Got to get your training. Well, that's right. For me, I was because I'd had so much experience and. And I knew the switcher, you know, there was a, there was, there was an opportunity for me to just pretty much bypass a lot of the, well, you know, grunt work and Mm -hmm. go straight into, and go straight into the technical director's chair. So that was, so so you didn't wrap any cables? I'm Clem. Have you, you didn't load any bins cable? Well, I'm just Have saying, you, you ever didn't do it during seen your time. Me wrap a cable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I did. I, I admit, my over under form is terrible. Oh man, I, I have be I have no problem loading <laughs> bins or tubs or camera cases or anything. I have no problem loading that on the truck, but you do not want to give me a cable because it will look terrible when I'm done with it. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, so give me uh, in our audience really an idea of what you mean by technical director. Are you talking about TD switching? Yeah, yep, TD uh, switching. You, okay. Just, you know, punching buttons. Punching cameras, that's right. So, okay, so then you were doing that for the Nuggets. Were you doing that for like the local broadcast or were you interacting with the team that was sort of doing the Jumbotron like scoreboard production? Um, I was doing, I was working for, I believe at that point, it was Fox Sports Rocky Mountain. So I was the technical director on, started on the away, on the away shows um, for the Rockies away, the Rockies away shows, the away crews when they would come to Denver, the Nuggets, the Avalanche, didn't, didn't really involve myself with the Broncos any because those, you know, with being the local stadium shows and the big networks coming in, you know, there's not much of a, not much of a need for people with people that are locals except for, you know, except for the utility work when they come to town. So I didn't, didn't bother myself with the Broncos, but between the, Mm -hmm. between Rockies, Avalanche, Nuggets, you know, I was probably working just from those three upwards of 150 days a year. Okay. Jeez. So, so, but when you were with the local station, you were full time, correct? Uh, uh, I started off as part time just because it was going to be easier to start doing sports. But, you know, I worked my way into full time, you know, after attrition, there were, I don't know, five or six directors on staff and, you know, pretty, you know, so within. So you had a full time job and then transitioned into freelance. Yes. I, I've uh, I've mentioned the story a few times. When I bought my house in 1997, it was April of 97, and I ended up, because of double dipping and whatnot, and Clem, you know what double dipping is. Yep, yep. Um, I worked, <laughs> Wait, what are you uh, trying to say? Hold on, hold yeah, on. Yeah, <laughs> I know, I know. Just because I, worked, I was tardy a couple of times. <laughs> uh, a, by a couple, you mean dozens, right? <laughs> um, Ooh. No, uh, I always say that I worked 32 days in a 30 day month because I had I had Mm -hmm. probably in that month, I probably had four or five days where I was doing local news in the Mm. in the morning and then going in TD and well, in April, it could have been any three of those sports. So, you know, I, I said I'd work 32 days in a 30 day month. Wow. So, what were the switchers you were wow. TDing on back in the day? Oh, back then we were on the uh, Grass Valley 3K and 4K. You might see nice. an old 300 floating around probably back in those days. But I think the three, the three, I remember when uh, Mountain Mobile, which turned into Mobile TV Group, which is what we still, we still, they're still the vendor for our magic shows. Um, for the TV mm-hmm. trucks, but they built uh, w- back then. It was mobile, uh, mobile two and mobile three, and they had they both had a, uh, a uh, Grass Valley three thousand in there. So, wow, yeah. My first uh, production switch I ever switched on was a Grass Valley one ten. I think they called it. Or oh yeah, 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 whatever it was. Yeah, it's like this little tiny switcher, composite only, and. Um, but I loved it. It did the basics preview, <laughs> T T bar and program, you know, with like one ox out. So yeah, it was pretty great. Yeah, somebody on Facebook a couple of years ago posted the the switcher that we had in in Bowling Green, yeah. my first job, and to look at that thing from thirty four years ago and look at what we yeah. have today, it's unbelievable. The switchers that we're that we're running now. Uh, the latest, greatest uh, Grass Valley K frame has over a thousand buttons on it, and then wow. it, and, and you're not even talking about the menus that it has. You know, once you get in, once yeah. you get into the computer side of it, but there's a, there's physically over a thousand buttons on the switcher now. I was I was just wondering how many MEs did he start off with, and to compare it to what uh, they are now. Oh, I think we might have. There might have been two, one for sure. You know, I mean, program <laughs> preset and probably one ME if I had to remember what yeah. the picture looked like. That's nuts. So. Did you did you see the recent uh, Star Wars Rogue One? I haven't yet. I've have been trying. Uh, well, I've been trying to get there because we've been on a long road trip, and I've had yeah. plans to go see it twice, and I have not seen it yet. Well, the best part about it is, I mean, I, I'm, anyone who's ever di- uh, directed and switched cameras pretty much knows that the original Star yep. Wars uh, Death Star gets launched on a grass valley. I forget which one it is, but uh, a pretty classic like production switch. Yeah, I think it might have been in the Rogue 1, yeah. 
Yeah. So in Rogue One, it's, you know, sort of going back in time and telling stories at a very similar point in time. And they totally pull out the original production switcher again. And you see him pull the T-bar. Yep. And it just makes anyone who's ever called or punched cameras just kind of, you get this little smiley, you know, belly laugh going on when you're, <laughs> yeah, when I you're watching. I did. I know I did. <laughs> you did? Yeah. yeah. Well, That's cool. Greg, I heard you mention that you hadn't seen it yet because you've been traveling so much. What is that? that uh season schedule like with the magic it's it's fun it's exhilarating and then there's days that it's grueling uh we got in last night traveled in from denver last night wasn't too bad because we had an app uh 3 p.m local time tip so we got we got here in your new orleans Orleans. yeah we're in new orleans so we got there we got to the hotel just about midnight last night but but a lot of days we are, you know, we're traveling after the game because we have 41 road games. We're traveling after the game 41 times a year. Mm, and dang. we're never, you know, we never take off before 11 p.m. Um, if you're if you happen to be flying east and crossing time zones like we did yesterday uh, gets, you know, gets even later. But we're we are routinely getting into getting into the city we're going to and you know get into the hotel after 2 a.m. Uh, a couple of weeks ago we had two instances out of three days just with travel and delays and airports where we got to uh, we got to New York at 345 in the morning and then after the game two days later we got to Orlando at 330 in the morning. Now you're talking nice. about delays. Hold on, you're talking about delays, but we're talking about private plane, a uh, team plane, though, right? Private. Yeah, it's airline. It, um, not necessarily anymore. There's a uh, a charter service that Delta runs that most of the NBA teams and a lot of NHL teams subscribe to. So, but it, I'm not going to complain. It is luxury flying. You know, it's a whole plane uh, 757 now of uh, all first class seats and whatnot. So I'm not, I'm not going to complain what? about that. That's not too bad. Yeah, Clem, you'd have enough leg room. <laughs> nice. Do you get your miles uh with Delta for traveling all that? No, and we don't get any hotel points either. That's the that, that is one downside, but I'm not going to complain. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I would be <laughs> that much travel, and I don't get my miles. Well, I'd be, I'm not I'd paying be for the flight, and it's always like I said, you know, we're in, we're in the back of the plane, but but it's first class seats. It's only four across, so there's yeah. there's room to get stretched out. All right, so I got a question. Then I mean, I guess just give us a high level overview of this sports broadcast industry where you're sort of traveling with one team. Like, how does that work? Basically. Are you? Do you have a contract for the season? And then, um, how do you get sort of your marching order? Who are you interacting with? Are you interacting with Fox Sports on when you know the birds live or you know all that kind of stuff? Give us kind of like an overview of what this industry, this part of the industry, is as a whole. Um, well, for us, we have a uh, you know I get my I get my paperwork for our. TV trucks and transmission info and crew info and all that, that comes from the office. Uh, I would say they pretty much leave us alone for the most part. Once the season starts, there's, you know, we'll have a few meetings before the season. And uh, once the season starts it, we're, I wouldn't say we're on our own, but if there's something that needs our attention, they'll let us know, but they know, they know and understand that we're professionals and we've, you know, in my case, in my producer's case, between the two of us in sports TV, we've got just doing sports. We've both got over thir- uh, combined over thirty years experience. So they they nice. know we know what we're doing. So they kind of leave us alone. But we get you know we have our uh, generally on game days we'll get up and we'll have a production meeting. Uh, the producer, myself, uh, the the announcers. Uh, our sideline guy, the graphics person, the our main uh, EVS or tape person. Uh, we'll have a production meeting in the morning and discuss what we're going to do that day for the pregame show, whatever our responsibility is for the pregame show, whether it's just a couple hits because we've got studio support or uh, or if we have to do the whole pregame show ourselves. And then the the you know the most important part of that meeting is the you know deciding what we're going to do with the open of the broadcast. That's kind of where we get uh, 
we get the most ideas and and discussion. Um, and then after that, we'll uh, you know we get a couple hours off, go get some breakfast or something, and then we show up at the truck and. We've all sort of got our own responsibilities once we get to the truck. You know, I I will talk to the TD and get him started on what we need for the day. I've got it after after so many years, I've kind of got it down pretty pretty pat. There's there's four sheets that I will hand the TD, you know, one sort of outlining what my expectations are with what he's got to get built. Uh, another sheet that will list all the cameras we're gonna have for the day. Another sheet that's got all the uh, all the video of the effects that we're going to need for the day, and then I, the latest one that I did was it's sort of just a it's almost a storyboard of a couple what some of the effects look like. Um, so it's like getting your just, presets together. Yeah, yeah. So I will I will get that to the uh, I'll get that to the TD and. Um, you know, go over the rundown and sort of mark that up with, uh, you know, once we hit air. So I'm not, you know, not totally unfamiliar with what exactly is going to happen. And um, then I'll usually uh, grab the Fox box because I have a, uh, I'm pretty, uh, I like to see things a certain way on the Fox box with how our uh, statistics that we, that we pop up out of the box are presented. So I'll uh, I'll usually sit back there on the on the away games on the home games I let my guy at home do it but on the away shows I'll I'll take take responsibility for it and I'll sit back there for an hour or two and just make sure that make sure that all our sponsors are loaded correctly um, you know all the uh, all the rosters and stats are updated put in the stuff that I want to get put in how it's going to look so and, you're going back uh, to your yeah. graphics days at news too. Oh, well, sort of. You know, I, I, I admit I like I like being hands on. You know, I just don't like, you know, so it's good for me to, you know, I can't I can't TD and direct the show, which would be, you know, great. But you just can't do that anymore. The, the shows have gotten way too big for that. But it's, you know, so for me, I can still keep my hands in, you know, in it and be a little more hands on if I'm if I'm getting the Fox box set up for the operator. So that, you know, that takes up a good, uh, you know, probably three, three and a half hours of what I'm trying to get done throughout the day. And then it's, you know, meet with the, you know, once the cameras all get set up and stuff, it's meet with the camera guys, hand out my, uh, hand out my headshot sheets, um, and, you know, take our meal break and come back and do the pre-production we need to. And then, you know, then all of a sudden before, you know, usually most days before you know it, it's time to, it's time to tip off. So. <laughs> well, talking about tip off, I, I would love to kind of get, I mean, you and I have worked together for, you said nine years. Cause you came, you said uh, you started with the magic nine years ago. So you and I yep. have worked together for nine years and our crew has pretty much stayed the same. Uh, maybe one or two people have changed, but we've established, you know, working relationship. And I understand, or I guess we, we would, I would say that we, both understand what each other needs and what what each mm -hmm. other can do. So how, how how do you work with your home team versus your away team? Oh, Clem, that's you know what the answer to that is. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> our 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 camera meeting camera meetings at home are very short and simple compared to the ones I do on the road. Uh, we have a lot more fun on the home, you know the home show camera meetings, I all the time ask, you know, Hey, you know, what was your, uh, I, one of the ones I did earlier this year was what, you know, what I asked everybody on the crew. I just sort of informally, what, what's the non-traditional food you're going to have at Thanksgiving? You know, <laughs> we, don't, we don't have that much fun on the road. Usually the, the camera meeting I have on the road, we'll discuss, we'll discuss more of the schedule of, um, the schedule of what's going to happen during throughout the day. Uh, as far, you know, as, as far as any pre-taped interviews or sound bites or, you know, where, where the handheld cameras need to be at certain points of the day. If we um, need to go in the locker room. Yeah. If we're, yeah, if we're, if we're doing what we call laces and faces in the locker room, any of that stuff, I'll go oh, over the walk-ins. Don't forget the walk-in. Yeah. yeah. The walk-ins. <laughs> Clem's favorite shot. Clem, watch out for the pole. <laughs> you got to walk the player. For anybody who doesn't know, the walk-in is when you walk the player off the bus and to the locker mm. room. Almost every game, we're picking a player and walking him from the bus to the locker room. And we're always like, well, why can't we just pre-record -re pre these and just pull them out whenever? 
Oh, because they changed their clothes and hair hairstyles and all that. <laughs> they get a new tattoo within. Of course, you know yeah. you could you could get, within a day you could get somebody of Clem's height and pretty much just put you know a put some you know put some generic clothing on him and we could Photoshop a face in and just have Clem walk. <laughs> Clem the is the so. ultimate NBA pro star stand in right there. That's I was that's what, that was my job as an intern <laughs> with the magic. Yeah, yep. oh, there you go. His beard's getting a little gray now though, so. <laughs> um, talk to me about kind of like the handoff or relationship you have with in-game sort of entertainment, like the production. So, i.e., Shelly, I know that they, I, you know, we get to uh, hang with Shelly quite a bit just because um, they use show flow for like kind of doing their rundowns and all that stuff. So, I've gotten to see how they sort of go through preparation of Shelly at the Orlando right? Magic. And, Shelly at the Orlando Magic. Yep, yeah. that's right. Mm-hmm. Um, but talk to me about how the truck and sort of the in-house uh, sort of control room interact. How much do you guys overlap your 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 sort of times leading up to tip off? Uh, for us, really, we don't have to be honest. We don't have much of an interaction once you know once we get into the game. the The brake structure is uh, it's set by the NBA, so they kind of do their thing in house, and we just do our thing and we toss a commercial, you know, there are, yeah. we get paperwork from them, you know, generally, um, you know, who's the, who's the anthem singer tonight? Who's the halftime entertainment. But, uh, really the only time that we, you know, we, we may see Shelly on camera when there's a, uh, when there's a review of a call just because the camera shot, you know, she's sitting right down there near the, uh, near the monitors for the referees. But other than that, I mean, it's right. not, you know, other than seeing her in the hall and saying, "Hey, Shelly, how's it going?" You know, there's not much that <laughs> I see her on. My producer probably sees her and talks to her a little more, but I don't. I don't necessarily interact with her. So, and on the games when they're one of the major networks are picking it up, are you guys replaced at that point, or are you running parallel? Are you guys both like is? Uh, Fox still shooting. It I guess we haven't, we haven't done that in a while, huh, Greg? <laughs> There's the, we do have one coming up. Uh, I don't remember who it is, but we do have an ESPN game. I believe it's a home game too. So uh, there are exclusives for TNT on Thursdays and ABC on Sundays. If it's an ESPN game any other day, we're right there next to them. So those are kind of nice. We get to you know they've they've usually got. Uh, a couple more resources than we do, which and and uh, there's a pretty good working relationship, you know, because they have to come over and you know they'll want some video or something. So it's it's usually pretty good uh, give and take as far as you know. Hey, you know, do you have this? Can we borrow this? So that's that's kind of nice when on those days. But like Clem said, yeah, it's been a, it's been a couple, maybe three or four years since we've even had an ESPN game. So yeah, I remember when we were uh, when we were doing very well, uh, the Magic. Um, you know, we had Dwight Howard. We had some. Um, we we just had a, a better record overall, and we had a lot of those overlapping games. And we were traveling, or you know, the team was exciting. Everything was going well for us. And I think during that time is when you got married. Am I am I right with that? Uh, it's well, it's uh, no, actually uh, it's been four years now. So four years. I okay. guess that so was the first. That was the first Jacques Vaughn year. So it was right after that. Yeah, yeah. How has that whole schedule and the magic and all that? How has that a you know affected your relationship with your wife? I know she's in the industry as well, but overall, uh, she oh she is. Yeah, Which, that's awesome. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, luckily, my wife's fantastic. Love her to death, and she gets what I do. She understands the demands of being on the road for, in this case, twelve days. Um, Mm -hmm. she's very excited that I'm coming home tomorrow. Um, but she, you know, she, she, she doesn't like to look at the schedule. She doesn't like to know when I'm gone, but she, she understands that that's what I need to do. So it's, it's usually not an issue. You know, it makes the, uh, makes the honey do list a little bit bigger when I get home, but (laughs) you know, geez, all the, all the, all the stuff that has been, you know, put off for the last 12 days, all of a sudden has to be done. So, yeah, we, we overstand other people in the industry overstand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. So what, what does she do? What, what, what Uh, what kind of stuff does she she do in the industry? She she does graphics at a golf channel. 
Oh, nice. So, yeah, here in Orlando. Yeah, and she's nice. uh, she started there when they launched, so 22 years ago, whatever whatever that number is. So she's been with yeah. them for that whole time. So yeah, I get it. I uh, my wife Carly, she works for an Orlando based production company, Tek. That Cole, uh, that uh, Clem and I know very well. But anyways, it's funny. By the time I came off the road from gigging, you know, pretty much a couple weeks a month, and really worked on show flow and getting that off the ground. I met her, and then she goes and works for a production company, and so now she's on the road. It's like a trade off, but, uh, <laughs> but we get it, and that's just kind of that's just kind of the nature of the industry, yeah. I guess. Well, my wife and I knew each other from local news in Tampa back in the uh, back in the early '90s, and you know, we we would you know socialize at work, but that was about it. And then uh, you know, I get the job with the magic, and all of a sudden, it's you know, we found ourselves spending spending more and more time hanging out with each other. So that was kind of nice. So, yeah. so what do you do when you're off season from the magic? What's your kind of uh, summer sport, uh, et cetera? What do you do? Uh, I still have one foot in the Denver market. I wouldn't say I have both feet anymore, but I still have one foot in the Denver market. So I get back there five or six times a summer uh, just to do some TD work. I, you know, I still love punching buttons. So there are uh, yep. visiting teams that come in and do the Rockies, and they they request me to do to work their games. And you know, you sort of have to admit, Denver in the summertime it might be a little bit better than Orlando in the summertime. <laughs> Just a little bit. Are you sure? <laughs> Just a little. So it's so it's a nice break to get out there for four or five or six days, and you know, tend to tend to things out in Denver and enjoy the uh, enjoy the dry weather. Yeah. Well, uh, we got to wrap, Greg, but I mean, I just got to say it. This was awesome. I really, really appreciate it. And just hearing your perspective and sort of your tiny little slice, uh, which is just the nuggets and the magic of this greater industry already. It's a different voice than we've had on this uh, podcast so far. So, uh, again, just really want to say thank you for joining us. Today. It's been a pleasure. If you need a part two, I'm uh, I'm game. Yeah, that's what I was just thinking. Of. I was like, we got to get him in for part two because we basically just scratched yeah, the surface. Barely, yeah, for well, sure. well, did you yeah. did you hear that he said if you're interested in part two, I'm game. You hear, did you hear the pun? Ooh, the little pun there. I heard that. I heard that. <laughs> Nice. Well, everybody, again, just uh, thank you so much uh, for, for tuning in again to another week of the production channel. This is what we want to do. We want to bring you guys the latest and greatest uh, really from across the whole industry. Today we got sports. We're also bringing uh, House of Worship. We're bringing event production. We're bringing concerts. We're bringing touring. So if you know anybody who wants to get involved uh, or wants to share their story, have them reach out to Clem or I or go to theproductionchannel.com. Hey, you know what, Bolsey? I want to hear, hear, hear some Broadway you know, like we, oh, I want to get, I want to get Broadway. Theater. You know, this is the last year of the circus. Yeah. I want to hear about the circus life. This, oh, I know. I just heard about that circus last year. The Ringling Brothers. You know, like let's yeah. let's talk about some of that stuff. Let's get some of those people in here to interview them. Dude, I love that. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again, everybody, and tune in next week on the Production Channel. Chatter. <laughs> <laughs>